Good morning, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Okay. Um, I'm sure many of you have been already to Elaine's session in the Collins Quiz and the Corpus talk yesterday. And it is absolutely my privilege to introduce Elaine once again. And she's the international publisher for Collins Publishing now. And she has had a long and varied career in publishing and teacher training. And um, she joined Collins in 2011. And today she's going to give you that one magic bullet, though there is no single one. Um, and I am sure uh, we teachers can be empowered to become more confident about the complex rule of English language after today's talk. Please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's lovely to see so many of you here and some familiar faces, which is very nice. Yes. yes. Um, at the end of the talk, please fill in the feedback form that is in your folder. And at the end of the talk, also please come and get a handout from me. I have a one-page handout, which I will give out at the end, which has all of the examples that you're going to see on the screen. Don't worry about writing them down. There's a handout for you to collect at the end. Now, I've been visiting India for five or six years now, and the last 18 months, my focus has been teacher development workshops, professional development workshops for teachers in schools around the subject of ELT, particularly around pronunciation, phonetics, phonics, using dictionaries in the classroom, corpus, language activities, and reading. And teachers often say to me things like, why are there three different ways of spelling the word two? T-O, T-O-O, T-W-O. Why is it three spellings but one pronunciation? Why is it but, cut, gut, hut, but put? Why is the plural of mouse mice? And unfortunately, the answers to these questions are very, very complicated. Um, and I think one thing driving lots of these questions is a common misconception about English. That English is a static language, that it can be clearly defined with a set of rules and put in a box and packaged up nicely, and that when you've learnt that language, that's it, you've mastered English. Unfortunately, English isn't like that. There are three things that I think we need to help teachers understand to empower them better in the classroom. One, that English has a long and complex history of over a thousand years. Those of you who've been to my workshops have heard the Anglo-Saxon that I've been playing this week, the Old English. That is barely recognizable to us today as the same language, but it is. The second thing that I need, I think we need to help teachers understand, is that English is continuing to change. And those of you who came to the corpus session yesterday will have found out about some of the recent changes, the, ne the neologisms, the changes to grammar that English is still undergoing. English is still changing. It's not fixed and static. And the other thing that I think we need to help teachers understand is that English is very different depending on where in the world you're speaking it, whether you're in the UK or the US or India depending on your age. People of different generations speak English a bit differently. And depending on what you're using English for, the English that you use will be different if you're talking to your boss to the English that you use if you're talking to friends and family. And I think these are three things that we need to help teachers understand. There is no one single concept of English. There is no one single definable thing that we can get hold of. So today, I'm going to be starting to tackle some of the very tricky issues around the history of English and how understanding, just understanding that English has a long <laughs> and complex history, how it can help you understand some of the oddities and apparent irregularities of English. I'm going to start by looking at silent K. Silent K. Now when we say these words, we say night, 
knee, knife. We don't pronounce the K. For Chaucer and Shakespeare, that K was a pronounced letter. They would have said, as we heard earlier, earlier this week, Kneef, knight, knee. We don't know why the sound dropped out of the English language, but we do know that it started to be lost in the 16th century and that it had gone by the end of the 17th century. As I say, we don't know why the sound dropped out, but the linguist André Martinet talks about a principle of least effort. Basically, some sound combinations are harder for our mouths to make than others, and that can cause some sounds to be lost. Whatever, we have now lost the pronunciation for K. Originally, it was pronounced. Then we have other silent letters. The L is silent in a word like calm or talk. The R is silent for me in my accent in a word like car. But even these are residualisms. In some parts of the world, the west coast of Scotland, for example, they pronounce the L, which is silent for me. And then there are rhotic accents of English, such as parts of the US, where they will pronounce the R. But for most of us, these letters are silent. They've just fallen out of pronunciation. And then if we think about GH words, there are lots of words with GH in them. Rough, thought, though, ghastly. What's happened to GH words? Originally, the GH represented a sound, H, at the back of the throat, H. We don't have that sound in, in present-day English anymore. Huh. It survives in Scots. If any of you go to Scotland, that very common word loch has a h in the back of the, at the back of it. But it's gone from present-day contemporary English. What happened to this? Well, two things have happened to it. At the end of some words under influence from Old Norse, and the Vikings invaded England and brought Old Norse, speakers of Old English heard words with a f sound at the end of them. And the ch changed to f by analogy under the influence of Old Norse. In other cases, though, it dropped out completely, as in though. And this seems to have been a native development. Okay? So, we've got local development, a native development, meaning that the H has become silent in some words, but by analogy with Old Norse, in other words, it's become F. But we still keep the spelling, although we have different ways of pronouncing it now. Now let's think about the silent B in doubt. Where does that come from? Any ideas where that comes from? Well, that was actually added to the word by a group of particularly annoying people in the 16th and 17th century called the spelling reformers. Doubt comes from Old French, doute. And Chaucer would have said doot, okay? And he would have spelt it D-O-U-T, doot. But the spelling reformers in the 16th century wanted to make words look more prestigious. They wanted, them to make, they wanted to make them look posher, fancier, smarter. So the spelling reformers spotted this word in Latin, dubitum, meaning et, and they thought, ah, oh, let's put the B in. Let's put a B in doubt to make it look like it comes from Latin, so that it looks posher. Isn't that an annoying thing to do? But that's what they've done with lots and lots of English words. The pesky spelling reformers in the 16th and 17th century added letters to make them look like they come from French or Latin. French or Latin are languages of prestige in England in the early medieval and the Renaissance periods. And if people wanted to pretend that they were posh, 
that they had a lot of money, that they were wealthy, they were well-educated. They would pepper their words with French and Latin words. Anyway, B is because of spelling reformers, very annoyingly. So, some letters have become silent because the pronunciation has changed, perhaps through André Martinet's principle of least effort. In some dialects of English, you might still hear some silent letters, like the L in the west of Scotland or the R in parts of the US. Some silent letters are silent for all of us, and some silent letters are because of human interference, spelling reform interference with the spelling system in the 16th and 17th century. So it's a complicated system, okay? And it's helpful for teachers to understand that it's complicated. We're now going to look at some pronunciation, how spelling and pronunciation have worked together historically in English. So we're going to look at these three words, and this is how I say them. Good, food, flood. Good and food rhyme for me. Flood is a bit different. If you travel to different parts of the UK, you will hear these words said differently. In the north of England, somebody with a northern English accent will rhyme good and flood. They will say good flood. Okay? Good flood. Go to Newcastle, good flood. That's what you'll hear. If you come up to Scotland where I live, people rhyme good and food. Okay? Good food. I can't do it very well. Good food. Uh, do we have any Scots in the audience? No? Okay, you'll have to take my, my approximation. Good food. They say the words differently. So what's going on here? Shakespeare rhymed all of these three words. He said them all with the long vowel that I have in food. Shakespeare would have said food, good, flood. Okay? But what's happened is, because of those pesky spelling reformers in the 16th and 17th century, in addition to that, yes, double, F -L, double -O -D, you have F -L -U -I -D also. That's different. That's a different one. Please leave that. We're only looking at these three words. English is very, very complicated. Okay? What happened is that the pronunciation has changed. In the 16th and 17th century, because of the spelling reform, the spelling started to be very codified. So spelling hasn't changed, doesn't change after the 16th, 17th centuries much, to reflect pronunciation. So now wherever you go in the English-speaking world, speakers have different versions, different ways of saying that vowel in those three words, but we've only got one spelling system for them. Let's look at these two words. Say these two words for me. Everybody say these. Meat and meat. They're homophones, aren't they? Yep. Same sound, two different spellings. Not for Shakespeare. Shakespeare would have said this word, mate. Mate. He would have said mate and meat. Okay? Mate and meat. Nowadays... Most words with an E-A spelling rhyme with words with E-E -E spelling. Feet and feet, T and T, C and C. We don't make any difference in the pronunciation of these words. So what we think happened is that in the 18th century, the E-A pronunciations started to rhyme with the E-E -E pronunciations, which is why we now have meat and meat and all of these other pairs as homophones. But there's an exception. Be in English, there's always an exception. And the rhyming didn't happen with these words, great stake and break. Now, the reasons why the rhyming didn't happen with these words are very complex. And the late linguist Michael Samuels believed and argues that these three, the pronunciation for these three, did not align with E because of something called, I'll show you this word quickly, phonesthesia, the association of particular clusters of sounds 
with particular semantic components. So if we think of words like st, Michael Samuels would say that all the words that begin with st are to do with suddenness, start, stutter, stop. Okay, that's phonesthesia. It's a disputed theory. Okay, not everybody believes it, but Michael Samuels writing in the, I believe in the 1970s, argued that great stake and break, that A sound there has a phonesthetic element. You might notice that ye also kept its pronunciation A rather than aligning to be E. And we think that ye has kept its pronunciation because of its analogy with nay. You often hear ye and nay together. They mean yes and no. And in Parliament, when, peer, when MPs are asked to vote, it's you either vote yea or nay. So they're a pair, and we think yea has retained its pronunciation because of its association with nay. So it's complicated, lots of different things going on. But what these all show is that the spelling system of English is historically situated. It really dates from the 16th and 17th century. And it hasn't changed to, to, to keep up with pronunciation change. And this has always annoyed spelling reformers. Of course, I think everybody knows this example. This is George Bernard Shaw, very much an advocate of spelling reform. And he made this up to show how far apart spelling and pronunciation is. And I know you know this, but this is how it works. If you take the GH as it's pronounced in the word rough, you get f. If you take the O as it's pronounced in the word women, you get the sound i. And if you take ti as it's pronounced in the word nation, you get sh. So G-H-O-T-I spells fish, doesn't it? Well, not really. But spelling reform has never taken off because English is a written language as well as a spoken language. And English as a language of record has lasted for four or five hundred years. And we have needed, and I think continue to need, one agreed spelling system to ensure that people with different accents across place and time can all understand the same written language. And if we were going to reform spelling, if we took the decision today in this room that we're going to reform spelling, whose pronunciation would we take? Mine? Yours? It's very, very difficult. And if we reform spelling today, based on what we say today, what are we going to do in 50 years' time when pronunciation has moved on again? People sometimes say that RP is how the Queen speaks. Even the Queen speaks differently now to how she spoke when she ascended the throne in 1952. Apologies to anybody who really loves the Queen. I'll try and do an impression. In 1952, she spoke with a very high clipped accent, a little bit like this. Well, when I came to the throne in 1952, my husband Philip and I were on holiday in Africa. She doesn't speak like that anymore. That's a bad approximation, but that's approximately how she spoke. Even the Queen's pronunciation has changed. So spelling reform is very, very true. Okay. The next thing that we need to think about is a vowel change called the Great Vowel Shift that happened sometime after 1400. And this is responsible for lots of the oddities of English pronunciation and spelling today. Let's go back to doubt. I live in Scotland, and in many, in many people in Scotland say this word with a Scottish pronunciation, doot. Okay? So how, case, how come Scots say doot with the vowel oo, and I say doubt with the vowel ow? The great vowel shift is the culprit. So what happens is this. We know that the word doubt came into English uh, before 1400. Chaucer would have said it doot. Uh, Shakespeare would probably have said doubt. And what happened in the intermeaning time is that all of the long vowels in English 
underwent a shift. U became ow. E became I. Those of you who came to the quiz will know that we looked at the words, the old English words, wheat, which is modern day English white, and that we looked at the old English word wheen, which is modern day English wine, and that we looked at leaf, which is modern day English life. Those vowel changes, the changes in those vowel sounds are because of the great vowel shift. Now, it only affected words already in the language by 1400. So any words that have come into English from other languages after 1400 have not been affected by the great vowel shift. So if we take a word like soup, soup has got the O-U spelling, but the sound oo. Soup is a 17th century borrowing from French, okay? So we have doubt with the O-U spelling, and that O-U spelling saying ow, because the O became ow because of the great vowel shift. But we have another word from French coming in later with O-U spelling saying O, that because it comes in late, doesn't undergo the great vowel shift. So we have one spelling, two different sounds, okay? So the great vowel shift was responsible for lots and lots of changes in long vowels. There's a funny phrase that people make, people say sometimes in the UK to have a bit of a laugh. How now brown cow? How now brown cow? In Scotland, people still say, who knew brown with the original pronunciation of the vowel, because in Scotland they didn't have the great vowel shift. Okay. So soup brings us on to another interesting question. Where do English words come from? We've already looked at how doubt comes from French doot, and we have here soup from French as well. One of the reasons that English is hard for people to learn is because we have such a wide vocabulary. And in lots of cases, there are pairs of words that work in a similar way. One of the reasons that English has such a wide vocabulary is because it borrows words from every language that it comes into contact with. So we have words like chocolate from Aztec. Okay, chocolatl in Aztec, I believe. Or words like taboo from the Polynesian languages. Or bungalow, yes, from Indian languages, meaning of or like a house in, in Bangladesh, now restricted to a type of house with one story. And think of all the words we have for coffee that have come in from Italian. Cappuccino, latte, espresso, Americano. Every time English comes into contact with a language, it takes words from it and brings them into the language. And we have a lot of words of French origin in English and of Latin origin through French because of this event in 1066. In 1066, the Norman French came across the channel in their ships and invaded England. And as a result, we have a much wider word stock in the language than we had in the language before 1066. Some French words replaced very good Old English words. So before 1066, the word for fruit in Old English was wustum. Fruit is a French word. It replaced it. Can we have questions, please, ma'am? Would that be okay? Fruit <coughs> is a French word. It's replaced it. So in some cases, French words heaved out perfectly good Old English words. In some cases, French words came in and allowed us to make a new semantic distinction that we weren't able to make before. French was the language associated with the conquerors. It was the language of the court, the language of literature, the language of culture. 
the language of food and drink and fine dining. The English servants, waiting on their French masters at table, heard them asking for beurk or poor or mouton. And they came to associate the French words beef, pork, and mutton with the flesh of the animal being served as food. People have been talking about this since the 17th century. Before the Norman Conquest, cow, pig, and sheep were used for both meanings, the animal dead, the animal as food. After the Norman Conquest, thanks to French, we're able to make a finer semantic distinction. And we use words of French origin, beef, pork, and mutton, to talk about the language of the animal when it's eaten as food. Because we heard it in the context of being served at table to our French masters and lords. So what's going on here is that the words that have come into to English from French, in some cases, have adopted a slightly different position in the vocabulary. They might have a slightly different meaning. They might have a slightly different register. They might be prestige words. And as I said earlier, in the, mid, in the Middle Ages, in the medieval and Renaissance periods, That's not right, is it? That's too formal for the situation. So we have a word of Old English or Middle English origin jockeying for position with a word of French or Latin origin which has a different usage, a different register, a different style, a different set of connotations. Here's another one. Here's another pair. Stop, rest. A rest is from French. It originally meant stop in English, and that's how it was originally used. It now has a special meaning of its own, but it was one of these pairs jockeying for position with an old English word. Now, this happens a lot with one of the bugbears for many, many learners. Lots of examiners say, when they read a piece of English written by a learner, that they know it's written by a learner, because that learner has been frightened to use phrasal verbs. Yes, phrasal verbs are difficult for learners to use because they have a complex grammar. Now, every phrasal verb in English has a French or Latin-derived single, single word equivalent. Extinguish, put out, destroy, break up, okay? Pick up. She's picking up after being ill with flu. Improve. They all have a single word equivalent. And learners tend to use these words because it's one word. They can see easily how the grammar is used. But actually, these 
because they come from French and Latin, have a slightly different connotation. They are more formal. They are slightly higher style, if you like. They are not appropriate for informal or all neutral situations. And this complexity comes because in the medieval period, to sound posh, people started using French words in their vocabulary. I'm going to extinguish the candle now, my lord. You know, <laughs> wanted to make the king think he was posher than he was by using the word extinguish, rather than the old English word put out. Phrasal verbs date back to the old English period. We have so many in English because of the Norse, the Viking invaders. There are lots of phrasal verbs in Old Norse, and English has developed them in the Old English period by analogy. Okay. Right, the next thing we're going to look at is noun plurals. And this is a very tricky area for us now. We've got lots of irregular plural nouns in English. So this is how nouns work today. Book, singular, books with an S on the end for plural, and books apostrophe S to mark the possessive, the book's cover, the book's title. A little word on that apostrophe to start off with. Does anybody know where that comes from? That's those pesky spelling reformers in the 16th and 17th century. They thought... Originally, books with an S like this, with no apostrophe, was the genitive, mark the possessive. The spelling reformers got it wrong. They thought that the last one, that, apost that S, was short for his. Okay? So they think the last one should be book his. Okay? The book his cover. The book his title. So because they thought that, they thought some letters were missing, so they said, let's put in an apostrophe. So that apostrophe is the spelling reformers. And in the 16th century, if you wanted to be posh, you would say something like, um, I went to Elaine, her talk, rather than Elaine's talk, because you thought that was right. Okay, it was a mistake, but that's what you thought. Okay, but this is what we have now. Let's have a look at some Old English words. These are the forms of the word stan, which means stone. And this form is the nominative and accusative, and this is its plural. You can see it's got an S on the end. So this is stone and stones. These versions are genitives, so this means of the stone, and that means of the stones. That's the genitive plural. And these forms are the dative. They come after a, after a verb that takes a direct object. So it means to, from, by, or of the stone. Of the stone, of the stones. So you can see we had six forms for that noun. And that's quite a complicated system. Okay? So remember, as we talk about this bit, that Old English has a complicated way of dealing with nouns and that we have a much simpler way now. This pattern, we'll ignore these, this pattern became the dominant one, forming a noun plural with an S, very quickly became the dominant form. But English, Old English had different patterns. This is the word for book, boke, boke. And it's plural, bake, boke, bake. Lots of nouns formed the plural by taking a vowel sound like this, which is a back vowel, boke, and turning it into a front vowel, <coughs> bake, okay? We don't have a plural, a plural of books that goes back to that now. It was lost, and we have this. By analogy, with the forms ending in S. And some words form plurals by adding an N at the end. Nama 
Naman. This is the Old English for name. That pattern has also more or less died out, but there are one or two residual things happening. You can see that while we don't have book, bake for book, we do have foot, feet, and tooth, teeth. So there are some residual plurals that go back to Old English. So now let's have a look at this word, mouse, mice. Now this is really complicated. The old English singular for mouse was moose. Okay, moose. Now, we've had the great vowel shift, which is how oo became ow. Okay, but the old English singular for mouse was moose. And this was another word that formed its plural by turning a back vowel, uh, oo, into a front vowel, oo. We don't have this sound in English anymore, oo. To make this sound, you put your tongue behind your back teeth and almost say, instead of saying e, say oo. Can we all do it? Oo, e. Great. So, Old English formed its plural, it took moose and turned it into moose, moose, okay? Moose. Then what happened with the moose sound is it's obviously gone from English and in the early Middle English period, the plural went from oo to e, okay? So it became unrounded. So in the early Middle English period, we had meese. Okay? And then in the great vowel shift, e goes to i, u goes to ow. So we've got mouse and mice. Okay? So that's why the plural of mouse is mice. I do have all of this on, most of it on handouts. Now, you might ask yourself why Old English even had this kind of funny fronted plural in the first place. Why did English, Old English even have moose, moose? Why isn't there an ending on the end of moose? Well, what happened is that we think there was an ending but we think it dropped off. So 200, 300, 400 years ago, in Proto-Germanic, we think this was the word, mooses. I've got an asterisk before it because it's reconstructed. We don't have any direct proof for it. Philologists have reconstructed it. Okay, and this, just to remind you, is what we're going towards in Old English. Now, what happened is, mooses was said with an oo, which is a back vowel, and an e, which is a front vowel, moo, sis. Okay, now that's considered to be hard to say. So, what people think happened is that the E in the East ending caused this oo to be fronted, to move to the front of the mouth, to move to the same approximate position where the E was said. The moo-sis became, under the influence of the E ending, became moo-sis, with that funny vowel that we don't have anymore, moo-sis. And that because it wasn't needed anymore, because we now had moose distinguished from moose by the vowel, the is dropped off. This is called the i umlaut change, and it happened in Proto-Germanic. And it's this change that is responsible for man 
men, women, women. It goes back that far. Okay. And then we have these odd plurals. And any idea where that N comes from? It's by analogy with the word brethren. People thought, thought that child must be like brother. So therefore, if the plural of brother in Old English is brethren, then the plural of child must be children. By analogy, it followed the same model. The Old English plural was brather. Brather got an N because people thought it must follow the Naaman model. Remember name? Naaman, Naaman. So people added an N because they thought it must follow that model. So these are complicated plurals happening because of analogy, because people are making mistakes and thinking child must be the same as brother. And now, of course, in, in modern English, we have brother with two plurals. Brothers, because it's also formed an analogy, a, a, a plural using the S model, we now have brethren with a particular meaning in English. I'm going to finish looking at some things from verbs, from the verb system in English. And the verb system is complicated as well. So we're going to have a look, first of all, at help. In Old English, the past tense of the verb holpen, meaning to help, was yeholpen. Didn't have an ending, had a bit added to the beginning. Yeholpen is Old English for helped, okay? But it was a strong verb. It underwent various changes. And by analogy with the weak verb system that formed its past tenses in ED, it became helped, okay? So we don't have a form derived from yeholpen because of analogy, okay? And this analogy is extremely important because it caused lots of changes in our verb system. So teachers today say the plural of the word dive. In English, it's dived. In the UK, it's dived. But in the US, people say dove. Which one is right? How is that? Why do we have two different ways of saying the past tense of dive? It's for this reason. Old English had two verbs, dufan, which is, was a strong verb, meaning to dive, and uh, I'll try and say it, it's got that vowel in again, dufan, dufan with the other oo sound, which is a weak verb, meaning to dip. Now you can see that they're very close semantically, dive in water, dip in water, very, very close. And what's happened is that the two verbs have merged, okay? That dufan, this form, has taken over and become the dominant form for all senses. And it's from this, dufan, that we get dived. Remember in moose, it becomes mice and then mice. So we've got the same vowel here, dufan, difan, and then the great vowel shift, divan, dive. So in present day English, in the UK, that's where our past tense comes from. US dove seems to have developed by analogy with drive and its past tense, drove. Okay? And this seems to have been used for the first time in 1855 by Longfellow in his poem Hiawatha. That's our first citation of it in writing. But this is a form that has developed later by analogy with, by people copying this verb pattern, drive, drove. Okay. And this is my 
last example. How many of you were taught this rule or this paradigm? I shall, you will, he will, she will, we shall, you will, they will. How many of you were taught that? Yep. All of you. How many of you still teach it? Yeah. It's still in that grammar book you all rely on, Ren and Martin. Yeah, burn it, please, burn it. Okay. There's a lot of confusion in the UK now about how these words are used. This rule goes back to the 18th century. In the 18th century, the word shall still had its primary meaning of obligation. As in the Bible, thou shalt not kill. Shall indicated an obligation, something you were obliged or we were obliged to do. Whereas will still had its primary meaning, a sense of volition, of wanting to do something. So shall meaning obligation and will meaning volition, a wish, a desire. Now in the 18th century, everybody was very conscious of making sure that they were polite. There was a real cult of politeness, particularly amongst people at court and in upper society. So it would have been rude to say you will, uh, you shall, because it would mean that you're obliging somebody to do something. You're forcing somebody to do something. So to be polite, instead of saying you shall, you had to say you will to give them the opportunity to express a desire to do it. Okay? So I shall means I am obliged to, but you will means you have a choice about doing. Okay? That's an 18th century usage. When we look at our corpus data, we find that will and shall are not used like that at all anymore. Not at all. That today people use shall to sound posh. Okay? We've got prestige and poshness still acting on our language and our language choices. So if I wanted to sound posh, I would say, I shall start my talk today instead of, I will start my talk today by. It's a distinction that is completely lost in present-day English, but we're still teaching it in some parts of the world to learners. It's an 18th century rule. So, what are the practical implications of all of this? Well, I think one implication is, I would suggest, is that it's important to give English teachers at least some understanding of the long and complex history of the English language so that they feel a little bit more empowered in the classroom should students say, why is the plural of mouse mice? I'm not arguing that they have to know the details and to be able to explain things in detail as I have done today. But I think that if they have an understanding of where these residualisms, linguists call these things residualisms, they have an understanding of where these residualisms come from and why they're in the English language, that they're going to be more comfortable answering some of their students' questions. And that maybe they need to be able to use terms such as English has a very long history. Pronunciation, the pronunciation has changed over the last 1,200 years. Spelling has changed. Sounds have changed. To enable them to talk with a little bit more confidence in the classroom. And I think the second implication is that if teachers understand how much English has changed, if them understand that English isn't a static, fixed language and that it is still continuing to change, that they as teachers are unable to say to their children that Dove is wrong, that English is still changing 
and that it varies, it's different in different parts of the world. That English is a complex, dynamic language, continually shifting, continually bringing new words in, continually leaving other words behind, continually seeing new usages. In the 1960s, my mother used to drink what she called frothy coffee. Coffee made with steamed milk. That usage has been bumped out of the language thanks to words like cappuccino and latte, which are essentially the same type of thing. So we need teachers to understand English is a continually shifting, um, shifting system of language. If we let teachers continue in the belief that language that exists, that can be packaged, that can be clearly defined, and that once they've got all the rules of it, that's it. They don't need to learn anything else. If we let teachers continue under that misconception, then we're not helping them. And I would argue that we are in danger of those teachers then passing on old-fashioned and fossilized norms of it that doesn't help anybody, anywhere, or any of our students. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or any observations? Yes, sir. Do we have a microphone? I'll do my best to answer them. I have to admit I've had a lot of help from in this talk. These are these are these are some ideas for further reading, which are on the handout. Um, and I've discussed this talk extensively with uh, Professor Smith, Jeremy Smith, who's Professor of English Language at Glasgow University. Excuse me. Okay, so I'll do my best to answer any questions. So nice to bring out that English is a dynamic language and it's uh, differently used and spoken in different countries. Now, I just read on the Google yesterday that email is going to be dead. Email is going to be dead? Right, and because I think it's the age of Facebook, or, or I don't know, Twitter or whatever. So what do you think of the Facebook English? As I said at the beginning, we all use English. Every speaker of English uses English in a bit of a slightly different way, depending on what we're doing. Okay, so I've given a talk today, so I've been very careful with my pronunciation. I've not used my West London pronunciation. I've spoken really clearly for you. When I write a text to my husband, Professor Jeremy Smith at Glasgow University, I use texting abbreviations, okay? That's suitable for what we're doing on a mobile phone. When I'm writing something formally, I wouldn't dream of using texting abbreviations. So it's all about what language is suitable for what medium. So email English is a little bit different. Facebook English is a bit different because of the medium. But English has always been able to adapt itself to different media, to being presented in different ways. When we went from manuscript to printing, do you know one of the big changes that caused in English? When we went from writing everything out, scribes in manuscript to printing, anybody know one big change that brought? Silent E. Silent E, okay? All of these silent E's. Um, they're an innovation by, by um, printers in the 15th and 16th century. They were allowed, I don't know why, but they were allowed, a convention developed, that you needed to have a very straight right edge. Yep, all the text had to come up here. Yep, that the paragraph had to be justified. So, of course, when in the 15th and 16th century you're setting out your type, it takes a long, long while to set out each individual letter, to lock it into the form, and then to print it off. So, if you had a gap here at the end of the line, you were allowed to fill it with an E. And that's where silent E comes from. 
Spelling reformers saw these E's in printed books and thought, oh, I wonder if we can apply a rule to that. And they applied a rule to it retrospectively. So no matter how we use English, no matter what the medium is, English can adapt itself to the different medium. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Ma'am, your lecture, I mean, uh, it is uh, very fantastic and you have completed in a nutshell, you know. Uh, I have a question. What, like Norman conquest is there. So before Norman conquest, what is the nature of native English? Dif difference between native English and Norman conquest. Well, the, in the Norman conquest. Thank you. The Norman conquest brought the French language the Norman Conquest, everybody was speaking Old English. Okay, I can play you some later. Uh, th words like Stan, Nam, Nama, Chiozan, Leozan, Ritan. That's Old English. That's what people were speaking before the Norman Conquest. And the Norman Conquest brought the French language, a very different language. Une langue totalement différente. So we got two different languages coming into contact. Um, uh, yeah, where's the... So we'll pass the mic round. Yes, ma'am? Um, thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Thank you. You focused mainly on spelling and uh, pronunciation changes. Yes. And why English is so difficult yes. because of pronunciation and spelling changes. I would have liked uh, more information on what Professor Jeremy Smith said there, okay. function and form changes. Yes. And in my sort of humble opinion, I feel that's a bigger problem. It, I'm than sure spelling it is. And I'm sure it is a bigger problem. Uh, that keeps changing. Yeah. And that causes a lot of difficulty mm. in a country like India, yes. where people don't know how to use function and mm. form correctly. Mm. And mm. they don't know why it's so difficult mm. in English. Mm. Well, perhaps I'll cover that next year. But the motivation for this really came out of teachers when I go into workshops saying, ma'am, why is the plural of man men? You know, why is English so irregular? So that's why I wanted to address some of the examples. But maybe next year I'll do function and form. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ma'am, my question is related to the very first question asked by this gentleman. Uh, he, was, he has talked about the FB language. So as we are uh, living in an era of uh, technology, the chatting, WhatsApp, Instagram, these are quite common things. So when we write something, uh, like we write uh, not exactly the abbreviations, we write uh, as the words are pronounced, as uh, the good is more likely uh, written as G-U-D, look as L-U-K. Uh, I just want to ask that, is it likely that in future these spellings will be acceptable for these words? It's very, very hard to predict what's going to happen. I would think it's unlikely because I would think that... I would think that newspapers, which are a major deliverer, of communication are likely to continue to use a more standardized spelling. And I also think that electronic and digital communication is also likely to change. So we may see further changes in how we write language in digital, for digital communication. When people first started texting many, many years ago, there was a great outcry because everybody thought that this symbol was going to replace that sound, eight. Yeah? People would write something like that in a text message. Okay? And that was very, very popular when we first started texting. I haven't seen that for a long while. That's defined as a usage in texting. So even within texting, things come in and things go. I think the key thing is, is that English is so dynamic and so flexible, 
whatever our requirements, it can be, it can be molded for our purpose. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Can I have the... Sorry. Sorry, no, it's in, you said it's intrinsically used. Yeah? Um, do you know the book by Joanna Sterling um, on spelling? Yes. And she says that spelling is the, how we spell it today is the result of five different systems, mm -hmm. one of which is the history mm -hmm. of the language. And therefore, that it, you know, I think that teachers uh, to know how to explain to their students and spell it, um, this is a useful way mm. to do it. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. I would like to know, uh, do you agree with that, that one letter has many sounds? For example, uh, when we say puppies and when we say pupils? Well, English has approximately 44 sounds in its language. And in the, le in the alphabet, we only have 26 letters. So for, all of, for, that, for that reason and for all of the things we've been looking at today, English cannot be completely phonetic. We cannot have one sound equals one letter. The language just cannot work like that. Some languages do. Italian is, is phonetic. Um, one letter, one sound. English just isn't. We could change the alphabet. We could change the alphabet. Um, that would be good, wouldn't it? Then we'd have 44 different characters to learn as well, you know, which would be fun. And think about the complexity of the vowel system then. You know, we've got, is it 22 vowels in English, I think? So we'd need 22. We've only got five vowel letters, so that's... How Excuse me. Exactly, exactly. And all of the different... Exactly, and all of the different pronunciations. Whose pronunciation of doubt shall we take? Mine or someone in... Yeah, but, 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 the, but the newspapers are users of the language as well. They're not in any way prescriptive. They're using the language naturally, as naturally as is needed for that medium. Do you have the microphone? Yeah, ma'am. Okay, and also we need to stop. So I'll take one more question. Uh, ma'am, when, you, when you're saying about noun plurals, yes. and you said about book S and it, yes. you said that sir, it ends with sir sound. Yeah. Is that right? And is it with all the nouns the same rule? Well, it's spelled with the letter S, but it's often pronounced voiced, books. It's a z voiced version of the sound. But, but that, that, that's a doubt that I had yeah. when you said okay. about that. Yeah, it's, it tends to be voiced. The S plural tends to be a voiced sound. Can I, can I have one more question, Thank the organizers? You. No, no, I think we're really out of time, but please come and talk to me afterwards if you'd like to. Thank you. Thank you very much.